Welcome to The Driven Entrepreneur, where we sit down with visionaries, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs and discover why and how they do what they do. We'll get the backstory, plus plenty of life and business lessons along the way. Here's your host, Matt Browning. Hey, this episode is brought to you by my very own NLP practitioner course. I've been teaching neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, for nearly 15 years. It is the most powerful tool for communication on the planet, and it can be yours today. For a very limited time, I'm giving away my entire NLP course workbook for free. Go to nlpwithmatt.com. All the patterns, all the tools, and the techniques of NLP in the complete course workbook, the same one that we use to teach our live certification classes, yours free. NLPwithmatt.com. Get it today. Let's get back to the show. Hey, welcome back to The Driven Entrepreneur. It's Matt Browning, and I want to jump right in this week without any further ado, because I have a one of our very few two-time, two-time guests repeating Mr. Hort Schulze, the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton, the author of the book, Excellence Wins and just a phenomenal entrepreneur in all spaces. I want to tell you real quick, a couple of things. I mean, not only was he one of the co-founding members of the Ritz-Carlton in 83, he served as the president and COO, uh, while responsible for over $2 billion in operations worldwide. He's been recognized time and time again as one of the leading hoteliers. Um, his company he recently sold, Capella, was voted the best hotel in the world, literally in the entire world. If you want some backstory on Hortz that you haven't, you're not gonna get today, you can go back to episode 140 in our archives, search for The Driven Entrepreneur wherever you get podcasts, and you can get a little bit of that backstory. Hortz, Mr. Schulze, you himself, welcome to the show, how are you? Great to be with you, Matt, I'm fine, thank you. I always, I said it just before we went to tape, but I sure appreciate you making the time out of your schedule and coming in yet again. You always have such a such a wonderful, wonderful attitude, especially as busy as someone like you are. I just really appreciate who you are as a person um, so much even more than what you've ever accomplished here. So thank you for being you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. You know, it, it's interesting. We, the first thing I wanted to actually kind of jump into was a little bit of this I hate the word post-pandemic, but kind of the post-pandemic uh, business reopening. That was the initial thought of having you on. And then as we're chatting, you said, well, I actually sold my hotel company. and But it was the best in the world before I sold it. Um, can you just kind of give us a real brief background on when you founded Capella? This is post Ritz Carlton, um, post understanding luxury brands. You were talking about the ultra luxury and the distinguishing markers in the industry, that these are two different industries that do not compete with each other. Can you kind of briefly explain that and the impetus to start Capella in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I, I started a big course. Well, I quit, uh, I retired from Ritz Carlton after many years, and, and it, my wife had urged me, I was traveling 250 days a year, mind you. And so it was time to retire. I was nearly 65. So I retired on a Friday and on Monday I said to my wife, I'm gonna do it again, one more time. She did, she was really upset in the beginning. She said, well, how dare you? <laughs> I said, well, only a little bit, only a little bit. Uh, and, and I was driven by the fact that, gosh, I see people retiring and doing all kinds of things they like and their hobbies. Well, some people like to play golf. I like to play hotel. So I said, I'm gonna do it one more time. <laughs> But at the same time, the fact is at the same time, the market was shifting, uh, not only in the hotel business. Just think about it. Uh, 20 years ago, if you would have asked nearly anybody, what is a real luxury car? They would have said Mercedes. Today, maybe they will say Bentley. And that shift was happening at the time. There was a recognition, yes, this is luxury, but then there is a step above. And this was happening with all kinds of products and so on, and clearly in hotel business. When I looked at that, and, and, and there were such hotels in the world, but there was no hotel company that could connect you around the world in that category. There was the Plaza Athena in Paris or the Clarges in London, all those fine hotels that are ultra luxury. 
and that serve a very discerning customer. So I made careful studies what that customer wanted. That means the customer that in a four season or its garden uses the sweets or the club level. What do they seek really? Let me create a product for them specifically. And that's what we did. So we found out what their unique needs and expectations are relative to the unit to the general expectation of the luxury market. And that that customer is a customer that's very busy, by the way, is a customer that's very discerning that have very fine homes, they have very fine homes. They're and not you said homes plural, of course. Yeah, yes, yes. They're not impressed by chandeliers and and, um, and marble. They're not impressed to them. That's not luxury to them. Luxury is do it my way. Do it my way. Would you say anonymity is one of the markers? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, but do it my way. And, and it's, it's, with other words, I cannot tell them check in time is such time, check out time is such. No, no, I check out when I want to. And, and I check in when I want to. When I have a reservation that day, when I arrive, you better have a room for me, that type of thing. And so, so what we, that meant I could not, create hotels that are large like a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons or whatever. Uh, where I have a Ritz Carlton with 600 rooms. I cannot do everything for that those 600 room customers. But if I have 100 rooms, which means an average check in a day of 30, I can do everything as long as legal, moral, and ethical. So I would call you beforehand before you come and said, you're coming to Singapore, what can I do for you? I'm here for you. Do you have a diet, an allergy? How can I be prepared for you individual? That is the ultra luxury traveler's ex expectation. Now, it, let me let me make it clear here. The user of those hotels are up to 60% of the ultra luxury discerning customer. The rest of the customers are saying, I want to try it. I have an, a special occasion. I I deserve it this time and so on. So it's up buying. So you're saying this is also one of the demographics where it's not the person that expects it every time, but the person that thinks, you know, when you said marble, I just wanted to point on that for a second. I thought that was interesting. The kind of person that walks into a nice suite and sees the marble and the expanse and they go, wow, that's not the right person because they're not used to that yet. And this that's is really right. special. That's so right. the kind of person that's used to that. But the up buying is another piece. But the up buying offers that. That wow is being offered to that to the up buyer. And that's great. That's a, so we are happy to have any customers as long as they pay and and take good care of them and respect them and love them. But the buying, the the the, the buying reason and decision is a different one. The, the, the up buyer says, I deserve it this time. It's a special occasion. I want to try it and so on. The, the discerning customer says, says, I need that because I want something very reliable. That I, I hope can. everybody's picking up uh, the clues you're dropping for any business and industry because what you keep, where your content right now that you're just teaching and talking about is coming from is deep understanding and surveying and questioning. Am I right about what oh. are their needs? What are their expectations? Who is this person? Exactly. Yeah, Matt, Matt, let me say it in, a, in very different words. And I'm going to say some totally different, but it means the same thing. If you think about it, hypothetically, on the left side, you look left and you see a lot of people. Those, is, those people is your market and your potential market, your customer and your potential customers. Now, what I have to do now to have a great organization, I have to find out exactly what that market expects from my product. I have to know that exactly. What do they expect from my product? Then now, now if you look at the right, there are also a lot of people. Those are my employees. I now have to make sure that my employees understand what that market expects from us. Totally understand. By the way, that's the beginning of alignment. Companies all talk about yak, 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 like ducks, the quacking alignment, but they don't know what it is. But that's the beginning <laughs> of alignment. You said quack, quack, quack. Yeah, well, alignment. Understanding the, my every employee in the organization understands what the market expects from my product. Now, 
by the way, and then create management, creates processes and systems and measurements and controls to be sure that happens, the delivery happens. Leadership again is something different. Leadership creates an environment where the employee want to do what the customer expects. And all that can be accomplished through processes. Simple as that. And in, in Capella, we just knew what that top market expected. We make careful surveys. We made sure our layout, our development, our product, and our services were fit to the expectation of that particular customer. So, Horace, can I ask you a question real quick on that? So you just said, I want to clear out the distinction. You talked really about management and leadership, which is something that I've been very interested in teaching for years. uh, And I know you have, and you do some phenomenal consulting in that space. And what I love too, is it's not just in hotels, it's in any industry because the principles that you bring to get your employees on board, the team on board really fits in any industry. So you said management is those principles and processes, the explanation of who is our customer? What do they want? What are, what are their needs, expectations, and helping the processes and the employees to be aligned to be able to serve them. And then you made one little distinction. You said and leadership is getting them to want to do that. Exactly. Was it, was it Tom Sawyer said leadership is, is getting people to do what, they, what you want them to do because they want to do it. That's right. And, you, you know, give me an apple and you can paint my fence. Uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about um, the, I guess, the, the, the culture of this? And here's my specific question. I feel like oftentimes when you go to something that's a little more high end or upscale, the employee and the the entire team are people that generally are not that company's customers. Fair enough. Like the the person that works washing dishes and serving is not the person who stays in the hotel. How do you, or is it a problem to bridge the gap of perception or misperception of the guest? Meaning you have a server who goes, Oh yeah, another rich so-and-so. Um, And maybe they're in the back of their brain, there's that attitude of they're the 1%, they're not me, but they demand everything. How do you, if that comes up, how do you quell it? How do you destroy it? Or does it come up at all? Is that a concern for these, for that kind of leadership? Well, uh, yes, it does come up. It uh, does. uh, Rarely, but you see, again, this is all so poorly managed. Well, because we all learned what Taylorism, that means we management think and the, and the employees do, which is a terrible thing, by the way, which is a, and that's called Taylorism. We have, we, we, hired, we hired people and that's all gone back because that's what we learned. I learned that from my bosses, that's what they learned and so on. There is little, philosophical feeling and thinking and, and, and relationship thinking with the employee. When even the, it starts with them, why do you hire employees? Why do you hire them? Well, you hire them, you shouldn't, but you do. You hire them to fulfill a certain function. So I think we touched on that last time. The, the chair in which you're sitting, Matt, is fulfilling a function. The microphone is fulfilling a function, but we're actually hiring human beings. So you hire human beings, to be part of who you are, part of the organization, to give them purpose and belonging. You bring them in. Now, you you make sure that their talent fits the need of their job, of course. That's the selection part of the selection. But but you do bring them in as a part of the purpose and, and, and and the motives of the organization and belonging. Now, In that moment, you have already explained who you are, what you are. Here's what we're doing, here's why. Now I have, now here, we are serving this top market. Here's what what I tell a Capella employee, if you will. We are serving the top market. In fact, in our ins in in, uh, New Zealand, it was $3,000 a night they pay for a room, a night. In in Singapore, about $1,000 a night. It doesn't matter. So that's a market we serve. And and here's what we want to do. Why do we want to do that? Here's, and we want to become the very best in the world and known as the best. That's our vision. Why do we do that? In order to have opportunity that gives you opportunity. Now I'm connecting the employee to the motive of the company and the vision of the company and the value of that customer. Yes, very so good. I'm connecting so, so that we grow. 
That means you have opportunity so that we are respected. That means you define yourself as somebody, et cetera, et cetera. All that has to be part of selection and orientation. It's not enough to hire people and then show them the function and say, do the job. It's, it, they will never be aligned. That's not leadership, that's management. And, and, and the question is that we have to ask ourselves in businesses, who will do a better job? The one that has to, driven by management and controlled, or the one that wants to, driven by their own desire of wanting to be excellent and be part of your company. Who will do a better job? The answer is very simple. Very simple. And it's such a higher purpose too, where I think in, like when I was growing up and I'm not, and I'm 41 now, so I'm not anywhere near ancient, but when I was growing up, it was still even the philosophy in the nineties of why do you do your job? Why do you work here? Well, to get a paycheck. Why do you work here? Well, it's better than the alternative. Why do you work here? Well, I got to do something. And the purpose is so low level oh, no, that, that there's disgruntled and people there's turnover. And ultimately to your point, the client suffers, but now we're seeing so much more what you're talking about, which is the reason you're here to do this job to your metaphor of the chair. The reason chair you're here with me right now is because you are producing a podcast and a radio show together and you're part of me getting the best excellence out of my guests as humanly possible. And without you, I can't do that. This is what we're all doing together. Chair, microphone, laptop, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> to, to use that weird and, metaphor. And as the leader, I'm not going to do it. I, I do it because it's morally right, but I'm doing it for the success of the company. I'm in the fiduciary responsible to make the company so successful. So I'm not doing it just for fun and being a nice guy. I, but I'm fulfilling it at the same time. Hey, can I, uh, I just want to pivot just a little bit. And I, I do want to touch on your backstory just for a moment, if we can. Uh, I know we talked about that a bit more when you came back on again, episode 140, look it up on demand. Uh, great, great interview with Hortz. But I know you have an interesting um, kind of origin story. And I, I'm a fascinating study of origin stories of successful entrepreneurs. And growing up, you grew up in a small village in Germany. And right. I know you, you've said that like at around 11 years old, you tell your parents, I want to be in the hotel industry and you've never even been to a hotel because they don't have any in the village. And you've also said that you're not quite sure why you said that. My question is, in your personality and in your growing up, um, were you always wanting to be maybe, were you kind of a helper personality, a people person, or were you a little more on the introverted, on the shy side, and this was the way to maybe get out of that? What do you think was that driving force that said, I want to get into this thing called hotels? Uh, uh, Matt, I have thought about it together with my mother and my father that are so often that I have co more, co more confused my mind because then, then found an answer. And <laughs> we actually don't know. We, we actually, and, and my mother doesn't know. My mother tried to know. In fact, she never forgave herself that she actually allowed me to leave home when I was 14 to work in a hotel 100 kilometers away from home. That was far in the early 50s, mind you. Being, wow. being far. That well, I mean, that's far crazy. for any 14 year old, let alone leave in a small village. Yeah. You went to go be like a busboy or dishwasher, like entry right. level, you started from the ground up, right? right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, you see, uh, what forms you is the associations I believe you have throughout your life. I was lucky. The first person that I basically met that I reported to was the maitre d' of the hotel, if you will. And he said the first day he talked to me, now tomorrow show up at seven o'clock, but don't come here to, to work, come here to be excellent in what you're doing. Now that went over my head at the time, mind you, but it had such impact on me. In fact, uh, everybody in my industry knows the motto of Ritz Carlton, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That was an SA I wrote when I was 16 about that matter D. And I said, we can, no matter what we do in life, we can define ourselves as ladies and gentlemen. And I saw that from him uh, and saw that in him. And it was with me. And I promised him, by the way, I, before I left there, I, I had to make the promise to him that I never go to work, that I always go to create excellence. Fast forward a few years after working in the finest hotels in Europe and so on, I came to the United States. 
worked in San Francisco in the, in the Hilton as a room service waiter with the intent to go back after a year or two to Europe to have a career. But I wanted to have a promotion before I go back. And I wanted to be the room service supervisor. And I knew I was the best waiter there. <laughs> there was no question about it. I knew everything. I knew things that they had never heard of. And, and the manager was German. So I will get that promotion. That oh, you have a little mine. in right there. I had everything. I had, this was mine. And I didn't get it. Another guy got it. And when I, it took me about three months to overcome my ego pain, to admit the other guy deserved it more. Because I was young. I partied a lot. When I came to work in the morning, you could see from 100 meters that I was tired. And... And when the, when the manager said, hey, Horst, let's do some side work over here, like folding napkins, I said, why me? Why not the other guy? Well, the other guy never said that. And he was never late. He was always sharp when he came in. That's when I went back to my little room in the Tenderloin district in San Francisco. Yes. I called it. French room, and I talked to my maitre d'. Now, mind you, he wasn't there. He had passed away in the meantime, and he didn't show up, but I talked with him, and I said, I'm sorry. Oh, I wow. Promised you, I promised you I would go to work to create excellence, and I just went to work. It will never happen again. I, How old are you at this point, Horace? Uh, this time, I'm 24. 24, so still very young, but feeling very old, right? Yeah, and I promised him I would never happen again, and from there, my career... Uh, took off like a rocket ship. Could you talk to us a little bit about what, what I, I like to call cause versus effect or taking responsibility? And you sound like you're this person who you set out at 14 to create excellence and to show up and, and say, I'm not going to go to work. I'm going to create excellence. And you have obviously the small dip in the road, but you've set out intentionally to create a result. And I don't think Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that it's happenstance that the investor group comes and seeks you out and we say, let's all co-found this Ritz Carlton together and take over the brand. As again, we talk about that in episode 140, how the brand came about and rebranded and everything. But I don't think it's a mistake or an accident or good luck or anything like that. Can you talk a little bit about taking responsibility for all the results in life versus having life kind of happen to you and try your best and see what happens. I think a lot of people out there don't always feel 100% responsible for the results. Maybe they feel 50-50. Oh, Matt, your, your, your destiny is a result of the decision you made along the way. <laughs> That's what this, and excellent, excellence, I keep on trying to tell people that excellence is never an accident. It's always the result of high intent and hard work. I so think what's you, my I, I think now? you just found our social media meme for this interview. Excellence is never an accident. That's right. Amen. And it's always a result of high intent. If I go with go to work with high intent to be excellent, I will be excellent. I have to high, but then I have to work on that high intent. But the first is the decision of high intent in everything I do. And and so I so that consequently the decision for its carbon was high intent. I'm going to create the finest hotel company in the world. That's why I went there. When I, when I started Capella, I, by, by the way, I retired on, from ritz Carlton on a Friday and I started Capella on a Monday. Now, I wasn't allowed to compete right away, but I, but I was looking for it. And, and the high intent was is, I will create the finest hotel company in the new ultra luxury market segment. And we will be known as the finest service organization in the world. That was the high intent. And, and now you started that intention, to be clear, when you started Capella, that was the intention to be the best in the world. Sure. So no accident that you literally got awarded the best hotel in the world. It's How connected are those two things? It's never an accident. It is a decision for excellence. It is it's, it, and, uh, setting a high intent. If I would have said, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a football team in the league and I say, I will be in the middle of the pack. I will never become the Super Bowl champion. It's impossible. But if my high intent is the Super Bowl champion and I work very hard on it, that's what I can get. <clears throat> Otherwise, you certainly will not get there. Uh, mediocrity, your, your decision of, of being average, 
which which upsets me sometimes because of oh good average. What what oh, wait a minute, good average. Okay. And, wait a second, average is the bottom of good and top of bad. That's all it is. So it, but if your intent is higher, it, then you will reach higher. Then you will you will eventually find the answers to the higher. Excellence is not an accident. And, and your destiny depends on the decisions that you make in your life. What would you say to someone who is fighting? So I, I want to believe that I can be the best. I want to believe that my company can become the best. Yes. But it's not that I've, I like sometimes I think people don't feel like they doubt it. They feel like they're looking out at reality. So, for instance, oh. say I'm, I'm trying to play basketball and I go, look, I'm five, seven and a half. The reality is I'm probably not going to be the slam dunk champion, but I believe and I, I want to create that. How do you, I guess, collate the intention of number one or excellence with what may or may not be reality that you're observing? Does that make sense? Uh, 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 of, co of course. I cannot say I want to be the president in the United States when I and I'm not born here. And it would right. be ridiculous. That would be ridiculous. But however, usually... When you, when you have a vision of excellence, of something you want to do, you said, whatever it is, what happens next, and that's, leadership, that's a leadership issue. You have to commit yourself to it. First comes the vision, the purpose, the vision. Then comes the commitment. And then comes initiating the step that gets you there, to analyze what gets you there. And here, the next comes the difficult part, keeping focus on it. Because... And I've learned that with so many managers, look, I had so many managers reporting to me, uh, uh, very excellent people, but I, all of them have one more thing that happens next. They find a reason why they may not be able to they do it. They may not be able to do it. They find, yeah, but you know, our location is wrong. But you know, if I would have a larger ballroom, but you know, if I, they all, what, what, what is that? That's the security and insecurity in the human being. They find a reason why not, they may not be able to do it. And we all do that. Just in case we don't make it, we have the excuse handy and ready. <clears throat> That's why so it's really the backup plan in a way. It's the parachute of, well, if we don't become the best, at least we have a reason so we don't have to feel like garbage. That's right. And, and, but, the, but the leaders have that too, but they refocus on the vision and they let themselves be driven by the vision and they will not allow the the potential of losing over here to drive them they will not allow that that's that excellent is, that's <laughs> what, the, what the difference between a leader and a manager a manager will keep on working but he allows he or she allow the excuse that sits away oh they don't call it excuse they call it explanation as to why not a reason reasons feel a lot better than excuses don't they that's right that's right when I just had something really fun when, so you've made a lot of decisions for there. Um, when people fail at something, when someone on your team makes the mistake, or let's say as the vision for the hotel, you say, this is the year we're going to be number one. And then you hit number 17. Do you, what, what, what's your take on allowing people to feel and experience failure or experience? I didn't make it. And I don't like this feeling. So it's like, I, I'm a believer that I, I want to feel the negative feeling when I don't make it, because that can drive me to change my result. In the culture today, I think there's a lot of conversation around maybe let's use the example of weight loss, that if I'm overweight, I should feel good about me now. And I'm not I'm not a proponent that people should feel negative about themselves. But I, I think it's fine to feel bad about the result. Because I don't want to feel content with being overweight. I want to feel disturbed about it. So I can make a change so I can become the best healthy version of me. What's your take on emotions and walking through maybe failures or coming up short for the team? The, well, you touch on a subject that is a, a hot button with me. That is the idiocy of society. What society tells you: Oh, you're fine if you're fat. Yo, well, you're not fine. You're unhealthy. You don't look right. You're not really satisfied with yourself, but you try to pretend. That's a lie. The lies. Are, so you will. So will you never correct yourself? Look in the mirror and be honest with yourself for crying out loud. Be honest with yourself. That doesn't, dim, dim, doesn't dim, diminish you as a human being, but you are diminishing yourself, your health, your future. You, come to, you are doing this. 
you you should make a decision for excellence in how you look for crying out loud. That's still with everything. That's a leadership issue. Lead yourself, focus on it, work hard, high intent and hard work. High intent alone doesn't work. Doesn't it doesn't create results. You have to do hard work. You know, in society tells you all kinds of things today, which are usually lies, which are usually lies to make 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 a certain group feel better about themselves. That's what those lies have been established. And the other group try to try to be magnanimous and talk about it. It's pretty soon believe it. Truth, the truth is, the truth works still, by the way. <laughs> the truth works. And what's important too is I think it, you're not saying go look in the mirror uh, for that example and judge yourself by what people think you should be. No, look in the no. mirror and see it for yourself. It's Are not you about okay them. With it's about you. Yes. It's about your health. It's about your success. It's about your feeling good. It's not about them. You don't do it for them. You do it for yourself. And respect respect people around you. At the same time, respect people. That doesn't mean that people should not respect you as a human being if you're fit, to stay with that. that and that's not what I'm advocating here, by all means. I'm saying be strong. Make a decision for excellence and go after it. Very good. Hey, what What's one of the hardest decisions that you've had to make as a leader? And I'm happy to go back as many years. Does anything stick out maybe in the business world that you went, this is an impossible decision, but you had to shoulder the responsibility? Well, of course, a number of times. The worst thing is firing people who are otherwise excellent human beings and in some cases, friends. And and that is a, it's a agonizing moment. Those are, those are terribly agonizing, painful moments. And it's, they, they hang with you. They hang with you because the disappointment by the other person, the, the losing of friendships and so on, the knowing that I hurt them, their life. But you see, as a leader, I am not allowed to compromise. I have to, I have to know as the leader, and that's a key element of a leader. I'm setting a vision for the company to be the be number one in the world. All right. Now the next thing I have to do. I have to agonize and say, is this really good for all concerned? All, meaning the investor, society, the employees, the customer. And if the answer is an unequivocal yes, it's good for all, then I have no more right to compromise it because one or the other and, and be in order to avoid my own pain. I have no more right. I have to move forward. This. I am now committed in a fiduciary sense, in a moral sense, in every sense, to move the company toward that area because I know it's good for all concerned. And that brings with that many painful decisions, many painful decisions that you have to make. And, uh, or or I, another, another one, walking away some hotels because, because they, again, for the sake of the brand as a whole, uh, I walked away from a hotel in Aspen where I wanted to be badly, where I, I loved to go, but I had to walk away from because it didn't serve. The owners didn't put the money in to maintain and there were other connect, the hotel in Houston. And, and, and places where I want to be and leave the employees behind that I promised, a, a, whom I had promised a great future with Ritz Carlton. And then I said, I take the name off. You know, those are very, very difficult decisions and they're, they're money decisions, they're painful decisions, but all, but at the same time, if I kept them, I knew they would, they would not allow me to become the best in the world. It would hurt the print as a whole. And I have a responsibility for the whole. So as a leader, and you make those, and those are decisions you make by yourself. It, 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 this is no, there's no survey. No survey works. Nothing works. You make the decision by yourself, and it's painful. Yeah, it's a, sometimes it's it's lonely to make the decisions at, at the top. There. It last couple of questions as we wind down and uh, let you get on with the day. Um, I did initially want to ask you, and I still do, about the reentry phase for the entire hospitality industry. And yeah. you might have, of course, a unique perspective on this with your experience and and now recently selling the company. 
what I see a lot and my specific question isn't just what should we do to reopen? It's I'm watching this cancel culture and I'm watching this over and above bizarre kind of space where the business owners of the world, and I don't just mean hotels, but all business owners, restaurateurs and, and museums, they want to serve their clients. They want to reopen. They want to be intelligent, but then there's this risk of if I don't go over and above and get paranoid, almost somebody's going to tweet me out. Somebody's going to call me out. Somebody's going to get mad and sue. And you're towing this kind of weird line where if I was, if I was running, I don't own any retail shops or, or hotels. If I was running a retail shop, I don't know that I would want to open for quite a long time. It would be scary because of you have this public opinion that wants it. And then you have the public opinion of how dare you, whatever, how dare you touch the lid on my coffee cup or how dare you not have it set up the way I think you should. Could you speak to that or any, any of your take on how, what a business or a leader should be doing in this kind of reopening phase, regardless of what state or country we're in? Um, maybe the, the, the psychological aspect of it, the social aspect of it, procedural, anything that comes to your mind, I'd be really happy to hear. Well, uh, I'm, with, with every decision I, I made, I always said, is it good for all concerned? Back to that again. It has to be good for the customer, it's good for the employees, it's good for everybody. Everybody. Not, not better for one or the other. It has to be good. So the, in reopening, I have to question myself, what is, is it, sir? Am, am I responsible relative to the to protection of health for everybody? Am I responding? Am I responsible? And then how can I do it? There's an answer of how I can do it in 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 in, in, in understanding I can do it in a healthy way, but I cannot dismiss that. I for example, I was very recently in a in a five-star hotel, uh, very well known, and they had uh, this hand sanitizer when you walked into the lobby. And in fact, halfway down the corridor to your room, they had it also. I was there for three days and the, both sanitizers were empty. That's totally irresponsible. In fact, there should be, a, a, the, every room before every use should be sanitized totally. So you cannot do those cheap stuff anymore that many hotels do where you give a, a housekeeper a maid 16 rooms to clean. She should have only eight now, but sanitize totally every room. There should be a sign on there with a guarantee on the door outside, this room has been sanitized. And by the way, that's the direction we have to go in every business. They have to know when they enter your business that they're safe. And you have to be sure, yes, they are. And at the same time that your employees are safe. That all of them, and that it's good again for all concerned, and and to to do this slipshod, I think that is one of the lasting values of 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 the of the disease that people will be particular hotels with their rooms will be more concerned about the, how sanitary they are, and it's not it's not good that I like I saw one time a few years ago when they when they. A film crew goes in <clears throat> with an infra infrared uh, cameras, and they find uh, on the floor and everywhere in the bathroom a urine. That's oh. not good enough. That's not good enough. And but it looked clean. Looking clean is not good enough anymore. To be responsible is good enough. So you have once you if you're responsible, then you can open up because uh, responsibly your business. And that's a, that's a question, are you doing the right thing? Again, it comes back, am I really doing the right thing for all concerned here? And if you don't agonize around that question, if it's slipshod with the answer, it, it, it's totally irresponsible, you can't do that. You're, you're right, you can't do that. And it doesn't matter what society says, you, you're responsible. You have a resp and you have to accept, as a leader, you have to accept the responsibilities. Well, that, that's such a phenomenal answer that, what I'm actually hearing from you is instead of worrying and looking out of fear, looking at what are people going to think, or is somebody going to flip their lid or you hear these stories, you're turning your attention the other direction and saying, listen, number one, responsible, 
Number two, excellence. Number three, safety. Is this good for every single person? And if it really, really is, then if somebody, if some client was weird about something, you can easily explain. It's like, yeah. listen, I understand that concern, but here's what we've done and here's why. And here's the other thing we've done. And we're taking your safety, you know, and, and you can actually explain that. And even if one person was weird because people get weird right now, I get it. The rest of the world is going to come to your side and go, no, no, no. This business owner really is doing the right thing. I, if you focus on the responsibility, the safety, good for all concern, phenomenal times. Uh, we are talking with Hort Schulze, if you just uh, joined us somewhere in the middle of the show. Um, his new book, Excellence Wins, is just a phenomenal, phenomenal read. You can pick it up on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you get books. Um, I think Amazon's probably the best place for it. And you, uh, where did I go here? I was just looking for the, here we go. Excellence Wins, a no-nonsense guide to becoming the best in a world of compromise. So definitely pick up the book. Hort, what is, I don't want to put you on the spot, but... Um, what's one of your favorite chapters uh, and concepts in the book? I know you probably have a couple. Well, in in a way, I felt compelled to write the last chapter, and 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 which 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 was very personal, and it's not because it is about myself that it is my favorite one, but I agonized writing it, and and uh, because it was because it was about myself, but I felt if I write the story as I did and ignore myself in there, it's really like kind of lying. So I kind of reveal in there, and I hope that doesn't turn people off here, but in, I respect any, any thinking, I, I truly do. I reveal in there, first of all, my battle with cancer, mm. where, where I was, told you have 10 months to a year le left and that was 27 years ago last last week and wow. i really reveal him there to how i can overcame that part and uh, that was quite, kind of personal and it is my favorite because i jumped over my own courage to do it because i didn't i want to i didn't want to and i felt I'm not really honest if I don't tell that story also. So that's why I call it the rest of the story. And, and the, the last one. So, And I explain how to overcome that, that moment and that difficult time. Wow. Outstanding. Well, hey, you got to pick up the book, obviously, Excellence Wins, and you'll find out exactly how he overcame that. That's, that's amazing. Horace, thank you for your time. Thank you for your candor. Thank you for your heart. Uh, you're really, really one of the good guys. And I sure uh, very much appreciate building a relationship with you. If you have any last thoughts for the people out here um, listening in listener land, what would you like people to walk away with in the um, world of excellence? Well, what I want everybody, what, when I'm, I try to tell that everybody, it's all your decisions that you make, but don't make it, not the loose decisions, but strong decisions, strong decisions about the issues of your life. I give you one example. I think I gave it to you last time. I'm married over 40 years. And in fact, in a few days, 42. And I'm still in love with my wife. I have friends who are getting divorced because they don't feel like it anymore. Well, I made a decision to feel like it. And you have to work on that decision. And so I don't only love my wife. I mean, I'm in love with that woman. But that's a decision. You see, even something that personal, but everything is a decision. And I'm say that one more time. And once we accept that and think that true, it becomes easier and easier. I said one more time, your destiny is not a coincidence. It's the result of the decisions that you made along the way of your life. And if you make strong decisions for the right thing, then you will, destiny will be one that is good. So, decisions. I couldn't say it better. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Solse. Okay, all the best to you, Matt. Nice to be with you.
All right, guys, that's your show this week. Hang on a second, Hortz. And make sure you, again, pick us up on demand anywhere you get podcasts. Grab Hortz's book, Excellence Wins, A No-Nonsense Guide to Becoming the Best in the in a World of Compromise. And you can follow Hortz as well on LinkedIn at Hortz Schulze. It'll be in the show notes on demand. And on Instagram at the Hortz Schulze. Uh, some pretty, pretty interesting posts on there and a great way to connect with a phenomenal human being. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week with another Driven Entrepreneur. Bye-bye.